Clay Christensen. He has received his bachelor's in psychology from Utah State University in 2009 uh, with minors in sociology and human development. He has extensive technical training and experience in electrical technology and heavy equipment. He is currently the AT Lab coordinator for our program and collaborates in the development of new assistive technologies with the College of Engineering at USU. And we will now turn the time to Clay for the presentation. All right. Good afternoon or morning or whatever, wherever you guys are out there, um, whatever time zone you may or may not be in. Um, first, you're probably wondering why. Uh, what's a guy talking about um, power wheelchairs and scooters that has extensive heavy equipment um, training? How does this relate? And I've, I've, I've had a little bit of a power curve, let me just throw, or training curve, excuse me. Let me just throw that disclaimer out there. But I hope what I will be sharing with you guys today will be very helpful. Um, I'm not sure. Is that the camera I need to be looking at, by the way? I know that's awkward but um, let me uh, begin let me tell you briefly how I want this to roll out I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about batteries well you know what quite a bit about batteries I'm going to give a little lesson on electricity one of the more problematic issues with power wheelchairs and scooters are batteries that is nearly uh, for lack of better root word that is the root to all evil when it comes to power chairs and scooters. Batteries cause a lot of problem, problems and issues. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. I'm going to show you a few tricks of the trade. Has it worth things that I've learned that I hopefully might be helpful to all those out there. And for those who are, you know, um, want to be able to solve a lot of your problems, hopefully what I will share with today will, will be able to help you. First of all, let me first begin by talking about batteries. Now, most of you are probably aware that all wheelchairs and scooters run off of 24 volts. Um, versus, I don't know if you can see that, 12 volts. We're going to talk about why that is. But first, let me explain what um, how 24 volts is created and how 12 is first created. Um, I have, I don't know if you, I hope you guys can see this, but I have some batteries. I'm going to draw a positive and a negative, another positive and another negative. And over here, I'm going to draw the same thing, positive, negative. These are batteries. And um, up here, I'm going to put an S for series. I mean, I'll just write it out. Oop. And then we've got parallel right here. We're talking about the difference. Most and all manufacturers today use 24 volts. And the reason why that is, is um, when, when using 24 volt electricity, it, it, it decreases the, um, basically, you can use a smaller wire. You have better flow and it uh, is much better for smaller motors. And the, the amp hour stay the same. And I'll kind of talk about that. Hopefully I won't get you guys too confused. But when hooking 24, um, hooking in uh, series, you always hook the positive to the negative and a vice versa, the same thing, negative to positive. This creates 24 volts. Now, um, you need to know on a side note, the 24 volts is actually kind of dangerous. A lot of times they don't tell you that. Uh, in, in a training course I took some years ago, we talked about that as it related to big trucks. Um, if you become the ground, as it were, for 24 volts, you can quite literally burn your hands, if, especially if you're wearing a ring. It could quite easily just um, burn right through your finger. Um, that is why most, uh, most heavy equipment trucks, earlier trucks back in the, I, I can't tell you what year it were, used to be 24 volt systems. That's why everybody converted over to 12. It was mostly a safety hazard has, as it's been taught to me and explained to me over the history. But it is not very practical to use 12 volts in, 
and, and scooters because of the wiring. Now, um, let me, in series, wiring increases voltage, but not the amp hour. In parallel, wiring um, increases capacity or voltage. So in parallel, we're going to go negative to negative. And by doing this, we can add another battery, OK? And we can add another battery. And every time you add a battery in parallel, what you're doing is you're keeping the volts at 12, but all of a sudden, you're increasing your amps. In series, every time you add another battery, you're just adding more and more voltage as you move on down, going negative to positive all the way down the line. Now, you see this a lot in big trucks because they generally function off of, of higher amps. But as it concerns wheelchairs, they want to, to maximize the, the most efficient. So therefore, if, you have, if you're using 24 volts, you can use a smaller wire. I hope that that makes sense. There's huge technical reasons, and I can dive into that if a little bit further, but I don't know if it's necessary. That's why we have smaller motors. But um, you'll see why it's very important. If you'll notice on your most wheelchairs and most, most manufacturers I've seen now, they've gone away from metal covers over the batteries because of the very fact that they could short out, especially when they're hooked in 24 volt series. If you have that happens, we kind of joke, we call that low voltage welding. But it's actually quite dangerous. And so you can kind of see if the camera moves over here. I'm kind of jumping over here for a second. You'll see why they're covered. Even though this has a plastic shroud, it is covered with these rubberized terminals. And it's very important to try to keep these over just simply, even though the, the shroud is plastic, there has been sometimes pieces of metal debris that come between the two terminals and can short them out and cause a lot of havoc. And because uh, all of a sudden you have that increased amperage, which the system was not designed nor, nor built for. And it uh, pops breakers and causes all kinds of other problems. So um, let me first, let me come back over here with kind of having explained that. I kind of tripping over my words a little bit. And I apologize for that. But now that I'm kind of rolling on here, I'm really excited to talk about uh, batteries. Now, right here, um, we've got a basic 35 amp hour battery. Now first, let me tell you that the general rule of thumb with batteries, um, with these amp hour batteries, now these are referred to as a deep cycle battery. Um, if you have any questions you know out there, please, please chime in and I can kind of answer what the difference between a deep cycle battery versus your automotive battery. An automotive battery, for example, just needs a quick burst of energy to start the car. It, it is never, um, it is not designed or does have the cell capability to, to go deep like a, a deep cell battery does. That's why when you're using car batteries, you're, you, the wheelchair or the scooter will last at a very minimal amount of time and will not have the power versus a deep cycle battery. And um, with a deep cycle battery, let me kind of explain how that works. They're designed to be able to go from a full charge, which is 14 volts, by the way, and not 12, give or take, uh, you know, a tenth or so of a volt. And they're designed to go all the way down to quite literally, I, I can't remember what the voltage is, but it can go quite low. And there, and then, but throughout that process, you'll notice that your power meter will be dropping, correct, on your joystick and or on your gauge, whatever it is you're using, scooter thing. But you should not see a decrease in power. It'll be telling you that the life of that battery is diminishing, but the power is not. That is a deep cycle battery. They can handle that duration, that kind of pull. And that's why you see amp hours. They give you a certain amount of hours that that battery is related. That's what's written on the thing versus the thing. That's why it's very important to make sure you get a good battery. Now, most batteries are sealed. 
um, any more. I have, in, in the several years that I've been doing this, I have not come across a, a I think, one set of non-sealed batteries. And if that is the case, if you cho choose to use a, a, they're oftentimes cheaper, but um, they, and they are not a gel style battery. I'll talk a little bit about the difference between a gel versus uh, a lead, a lead acid gel versus just a, a non, a non lead, a non sealed battery. Um, over time and over the use of the battery, the water will be, um, diminish in the battery and it's very important to keep that water level up and it's very important to use not critical but important to use distilled water when um, topping off your battery and you'll notice over time that if that battery starts drying up starts going through water quite fast it's usually a really strong indicator that the battery is losing its its life and it's losing power now I have to to tell you this, and I, I, I don't, I have done, I have mentioned before, it has been, I've been on a vendetta to figure out why um, batteries, I've had so many complaints on batteries, and I have done a lot of research on this, and I will tell you that most batteries, these 35, 55, and 75 amp, if being used every day, and I'm talking about to the full extent, by the end of the day, they're mostly diminished, that battery on average will last only one year and that is pretty much I mean that is written in stone you'll get about one year now let's talk about the factors that might change that most manufacturers on wheelchairs and scooters will tell you that when you're purchasing it you might see a sticker they might say okay this is designed to go this many hours on um, based on, say it's just using a 35 amp battery, it'll go 24 hours before it needs a charge. Now, you should know that they're basing that off of a person who weighs roughly 170 pounds, and that is also in a 70 degree environment. Now, we all know that that's not always the case. Some persons are heavier, some persons are lighter. The climate where you live, where we live here in Cache Valley, we have experienced some sub-zero weather lately, and I've replaced a lot of batteries because of that. And so I've had consumers come in, man, you sold me some batteries seven months ago, and they're already diminished. I'm already losing power. You know, what, what's wrong with these batteries, and how can I get them, how can I get them warrantied, and what's, what's going wrong? And when I um, tell them that, that, now I'll ask them questions, well, how often do you use how often do you use your batteries? I mean, how often do you, excuse me, how often do you use your scooter? And, uh, you know, you know are, you, are you running it dead every day? And that's a, a good indicator of, of what, is, is, what is happening. And I can usually tell them, well, you know, that's why your batteries have run dead. You've used them to this life. And we kind of do the math with them and help them understand. Now, let me show you... Um, on the battery note right here. Let's, let's talk about, I'm going to show you this right here. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is actually called a battery analy um, analyzer. This right here is a load tester. Now I will demonstrate the use of both of these here in just a second, but let's first talk about this analyzer. Load testing batteries is, is kind of hard on them when you load them. It's not the best thing and sometimes it's not always the most accurate thing. Now, a digital battery analyzer can, can be, uh, there, there's many makes, there's a brand called OTC that I really like. They're around $500, give or take. This one here is a $70 Harbor Freight one, but works well enough for us. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the use of this and why you would want to use one of these versus a load test, because this will give you a little bit more accurate test of the battery. Now... I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to hit OK. Now it's asking for amps, the amp rating on this battery. So I know that it's 35. I'm going to um, actually select through. And I'm going to change this value to 0. And I'm going to put this value 
at four. And you'll see right there that I'm now showing 40 amps. I could leave it at three, click over and get the 35. You know, 40 is close enough for, for the, this purpose here today. Now I'm gonna hit okay and it's gonna analyze this battery. And it's sending a current through it. Now it came back and gave me two values, okay? And if you're seeing this, you're probably thinking, God, this battery's in great shape. It's showing 12.47 volts. Um, and then it's giving me a value in milliohms called um, 6787. Now, I'm going to disconnect this. Sorry if that isn't uh, to think that. But if this battery um, should have read closer to 14 volts, I charged this battery the other day. And, and if it was at full capacity, it would have read 14. And that, the biggest value that you want to look at is those milliohms. Those ohms were quite high. There was a huge amount of resistance through this battery. And I would love to, to lecture, as it were, on Ohm's law of resistance, but um, probably not necessary today. But that's really quite neat. I would encourage you to, to Google it and, and read a little bit about it. I'm very valuable in the world of electricity, understanding how things work, and almost it, it's quite a necessity as far as diagnosing is concerned. But that value was six, seven, two, eight, if I remember right, give or take. What that should have read, if this battery was in good shape, was somewhere between nine to thirteen ohms. So you can see that this battery is quite dead. It's got a lot of problems within the cell. Um, the cells and is, is very diminished and so it can be quite deceiving that's why I would encourage the use of an analyzer versus a load tester. I'll demonstrate a load tester now this load tester is coming up and it's giving me a value of 12.46 similar to what is shown on that analyzer. I'm going to put a load on this battery, and I believe it's 15 seconds, and you can smell it. Now, this battery dropped down. Well, you can see the sudden volt drop. It couldn't even handle it. It all of a sudden dropped to 10.42 volts. Given a load, it should not have done that. It should have stayed at that at at least 13 if it was at 14. The volt drop should have been very minimal, and you can kind of see that it went down to 6 volts. But sometimes, in this case, this battery is so diminished that it's kind of showing. You have to be careful with these two because the grid on it gets hot. And I've seen, uh, I've known of buildings burned to the ground because of that. So it's very careful that you replace that on its end. That's another reason why I don't like to use these. Um, but uh, that is, you know, these, these are $20, give or take, you know, at most most places as high as you know you can get them at several hundred dollars now um, there's so much I want to talk about uh, let me think about where I've been I I don't I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, checking for charging and here's a few tricks of the trade on this um, sometime most from what I understand most manufacturers are going away from onboard chargers they've just had too many it's been too problematic for them, so they're moving away from them. But as like anything, there's lots of old cars out there still, and there'll be lots of uh, chairs and scooters out there with onboard chargers, such as one that's in this scooter. Um, one, one demonstration that I could probably show you, in fact, um, I think I can do that here. I wasn't going to do this, but... Let's move over to here for just a second. Let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the voltmeter. Let's say you don't know. You know, your, your batteries are running down. You're having problems. You don't know if it's charging. I'm going to take out a voltmeter. And I don't know if you'll be able to set this. I'm going to set this at 200. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to place this on the battery and we're going to see that right now um, you, I obviously you can't see but I'm seeing a value of 13.5 volts currently on this 
battery. This chair has been plugged in. Um, the, the consumer who uses this chair is uh, very adamant that we keep it charged. You always make sure it's plugged in. I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to plug it in. And I'm going to put the charger, or excuse me, the voltmeter back on it. And now I'm getting a value of 14.3 volts. That tells me that I'm getting a um, charge. I'm getting a pickup. Now, that could have said 9 volts. And if I plugged in the charger, I should see anywhere between a volt and a half to, to a 2 volt pickup. Now, we only seen about a half a volt because these, these uh, batteries are nearly charged. And just as a side note, this is kind of the same, the same concept applies for your, your automobile. You don't know, you think you might have an alternator going out in your truck or your car. Simply go out there, put a voltmeter, look at what your battery currently says. And if your battery's dead, charge it. You know, obviously your car won't start, but get your battery charged. And then if it says 12.2 volts after you've had it charged, turn on your car and you should see 13.5 to 14 volts if your alternator's working. Same principle applies on both both things. I do this a lot. It saves me like, oh, did, do I know if this charger's working? I don't know if it is. If it isn't, I can simply just take two seconds, throw a voltmeter on it, and bam, you've got it. Um, and you've probably kind of looking at this right here. You'll notice if you can see that this chair has demonstrated on the board. This is wired 24 volt, but a lot of times that that is converted through the ECM, okay? Um, and they do that, I believe, so that people don't get confused and, and it can keep from a lot of hazards and accidents happening because it is, we, you know, most people just generalize positive. Um, negative goes to negative, positive goes to positive. And we wonder why um, there could crossway. So a lot of times it's done within the control unit or electronic control model, ECU, ECM, unit or module, either way. Um, I hope that that's been helpful. If you have any doubts, most people can do that. Just grab, you know, you can get voltmeters. My good heavens, you can go to your Harbor Freight or local hardware store. I've, I've seen them as cheap as a dollar. <laughs> and uh, very, very handy to, to have. Now, I'm going to show you the same thing of the trade can be done on a power chair. You know, sometimes power chairs are not that easy to access the batteries, right? God, I don't want to have to go through all that. You know, it's a lot easier than trying to know if the charger's working. Um, one way you can do that is if you look on the charge port on a charger, if you can see that here, you can do the same thing by taking your voltmeter. Now, you're going to want to make sure that it's on 200 volts and not 20 because you're measuring 24 volts. When you, and it's going to be the upper two um, pins, will give you a charge. So you, I think it, it goes in this pattern. It doesn't matter. If you get them wrong, it won't hurt anything. You'll simply see a negative sign come across your voltmeter telling you that they're crossed. But if, if, you're, if your chair is charged, you should see, um, let me ask a question. I kind of pose this out there. Would you see 24 or should you see like 26? Right, it's a 24 volt system, but what, what is the correct value that you should see? You should see 26 or close to, to that value because, um, you know, if a battery at full state of charge is around 14 volts, so 24, 26 in that area, 26, 27. So again, um, I've done that really quick. I had a consumer come in the other day. I don't know what's wrong with my, my chair. I, I, I put the charger on it. Nothing's happening. I plug it in. I don't know what's going on. I walked out there with my voltmeter. I put my, my two pins in it. I think I saw 23.2 volts or something. And then I plugged it in. 23.2 volts. I instantly knew that that charger probably wasn't working. Does that necessarily mean the charger's gone bad? No. It means that there could be a break in the wire, something wrong with the circuit, and then you know, that's where the real fun comes in. That's where Ohm's law comes into play of uh, resistance. But most of the time, 90% of the time, it is the charger, and we just have a whole 
box full of used chargers that we get from parting out our vehicles, our, excuse me, our power chairs and, and scooters. And uh, we tried to take null and good parts and I can swap it out real quick and it usually fixes it and, and people are happy. But you know what? I'm sharing with you these little tricks of trade because this can be done at home. You don't have to try to get somebody over because we all know that sometimes trying to get a hold of your vendor or a technician or whoever it may be to come out and do this can just take for sometimes days. And, uh, you know, if that's your primary means of mobility, you know, it, it makes it difficult. And these are things that you could even uh, c can do and, and or instruct a, a neighbor, friend who can come over and assist and help and you can kind of guide them through these steps. So I hope that you're taking notes. Um, I try to share this knowledge with everybody that comes in. I show them, and they're like, oh, this is great. I can do this. I'm going to go to Harbor Freight. I'm going to get a voltmeter, and I'm never going to see you again, <laughs> which, you know, in business, that can be good or bad. Now, um, let's, let's leave that realm for a minute, and I'm going to talk about just some basic things this is you can you're looking right here the back half of a scooter that I took apart just for um, demonstration purposes here today um, if you could please dial in right in here where you can get my arm out of the way if you're looking at this out there you're seeing a gob of hair wound up tight in there right um, now if I were to turn this around you can see I've taken the nut off and I can tell you that I spent about 15 minutes trying to take this wheel off today, and it wasn't going to happen. Um, the reason being is because it's probably bound with the hair, but the main technical reason why, we've got an aluminum hub on a steel axle, and you have a, which then we talk about ferrous and non-ferrous metals. And they will gall and stick and corrode together, and it becomes nearly impossible to, to take them off. These are great tires. This is a scooter that I've had a lot of problems with, so I'm currently parting it out. Unfortunately, I will not be able to, to save the tires. I can't get them off, and I'm not going to try to mess with it. But one of your more common problems, and that's why I'm showing this, when people come up and say, Gall, it's slowing down, it's acting weird, it's heating up on me. It's because a lot of times hair, debris, and dirt gets bound up inside there, sucks into those bearings, and even though they're sealed, it just starts sucking them down tight and they can't move as, as free. And then it creates friction on the motor, and then the motor um, begins this chain reaction. The motor's all too much heat, clicks the breaker. And um, again, this is something that I see time and time again. So uh, just something to look for and to be aware of. Um, and on that note, I'm going to show you something that I like very much. And it has a diesel technician, heavy equipment mechanic. We use this stuff religiously. It's called anti seize It's a graphite lubricant. Every wheel that we take off, I've instructed those who work for me to apply this to the axles because it saves us so much grief. In fact, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I wish manufacturers would apply this on there when they are new because it could save so much headache. It keeps them from, from seizing. It, it is not a lubricant, it's just a graphite paste that creates a shield between the two different kinds of metals are the same and uh, can save from broken, on, in many cases, broken studs on a car um, or bolts, head bolts on an en engine. It's, it, it has, this particular stuff is rated, I believe, at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, there it is, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, good stuff. Of course, you don't have to get the gunk brand, but um, anyway, and if you're looking at this a little closer, you can kind of see right here, um, we've got a little bit of sweating going on between this gearbox right here. This is normal. I wouldn't worry about that as far as maintenance is concerned. Um, I've had people come in and say, golly, I, I left my scooter out in the garage for uh, three months, I haven't used it. Um, I was going to give it to a person, but I came out there and I saw a puddle. Oh no. And uh, what, what, what's wrong? They bring it up to me. And very quickly, most of the time, it's simply because it's set. 
It's the same rule applies with any kind of engine, motor, car. When, when things sit, they'll seep, they'll leak a little bit, but continued use will help that. So as soon as we started using, I just started driving it around for a couple of days. The leak stopped, it's sealed. And you'll see a little bit of sweating and stuff, and that, that's nothing to be worried about. But of course, I had to, to add oil. Um, and one more thing I think I could tell you that would be good to know. A lot of times, and this, uh, this applies across the board, um, simply when you, you're, you're having trouble with your scooter and you don't know why it's, it's acting funny, I take off the cover, take off the, the shroud, wherever it may be, whatever style you have, if it's not too inconvenient, and simply unplug and plug whatever connections you can back in. This is uh, coined exercise, or termed, excuse me, exercising connections. And sometimes you just need to exercise that connection and reestablish the connection. Sometimes over time they vibrate, they move loose, they, they become, um, uh, they spread apart. And that's another thing. If I had a, a connector, I should have brought one in for this demonstration. You'll see where pins will spread. And, s and a lot of times I've just simply take a little pick and I'll collapse those pins or I'll bend them back up. And um, it's kind of funny, I've got a technician right across where he's, he's smiling and nodding his, his head at me because we've been down this road before many times. And uh, just, just some, some tricks of the trade out there to save you a lot of headache, to save you a drip, to save you problems. So bef bef you know, if you're wondering why all of a sudden it just quit and it's not your breaker, take a moment, exercise some connections, see if it comes back to life. Make sure your connections on your battery are tight. They can wear, they can come loose. Um, I, I know a lot of times people get in a hurry, even those who work on them, and they, they throw them on and they leave the lock nuts off. I have never seen batteries that don't come new with lock nut, or lock washers, excuse me, not lock nuts, lock washers. And that's for a very specific reason. It locks that bolt down in place so they can't come loose. And when a connection comes loose, then you get arcage, and it causes all kinds of problems. And then you start popping breakers, you get too many amps um, happening. Um, let me, oh goodness, let me move over here. I think, hopefully you can see this. Um, if you're looking at this scooter, you're seeing that one tire is quite worn down versus the other. The reason this is the case, just like your car, this one's out of alignment. Um, and you can even kind of look and see that it's been bent. Right here it is busted. So, and I can look right here at this tie rod and this joint, and I can tell that it's been slightly bent, causing uneven wear and, and even a slight pull. Be very careful, um, those of you who are out there using them. You know, if you can look, if you could see this, it, these tie rods, very similar concept on a car. And I'm sitting here making noise with this. It's loose. And uh, the same thing can be done by wiggling the steering wheel and finding out how much play you have. And I, I can hold this wheel steering. I'm moving this almost a quarter of an inch. It's not necessarily good. And um, so you can, uh, a, a trick of the trade here can be done is you can take a tape measure and measure f the front, make a line in the center of the tire, scribe a line in the center of this tire. Then measure it from the front and measure it in the back. And when you do that, this is the same principle that applies when aligning, when you're doing alignment. It doesn't, nowadays they have fancy laser alignment tools that do this. They can just shoot it and it'll give them the same feedback. But if you want to go old school and get it quite close, take and get this thing up off the ground, take a pencil and, and I kind of hold it or a marker and um, just spin that wheel and it'll scribe a line in the center of that tire. So that's the same on both sides. Take your tape measure, measure from here to here, then go in the back and measure the back. Now, um, then you'll see two different values. If this thing is correctly in line, it should be at zero, meaning 24 inches this side, 24 inches this side. If it says, you know, if you've got 23 and a quarter here and 24 inches up front here, you're towed out and that causes problems. You get shimmies. I've seen people driving their scooters and they're going like this and their hands are shaking because they're getting a shimmy. Um, I can automatically look at that and go, oh, that's towed out. Uh, something's wrong. Something's bent. Something's caused that to tow out. So then we'll get it in and we'll take a look at it. Same principle applies with your car. Um, the general rule of thumb is they should be set at zero, so 24-24, or a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch tow in. 
is acceptable. And I could talk about why on cars that's pretty quick. They, they like to have it 16th of an, of an inch towed in. That's because of the crown of the road. And if you notice, roads are crowned. And that's for a specific reason. I won't talk about that today. <laughs> Sorry. My, uh, my uh, experience as a diesel technician sometimes takes over. And I forget what I'm working on. Um, but the, again, the same concepts apply here. And then, um, again, I've, I think I've talked about this. I don't want to be redundant. Just make sure your battery connections are always covered. Um, has this one is, even though it's a plastic shell, to keep debris from falling in. We've had pieces of metal come in and, and arc them and cause problems. Um, make sure that uh, tires are um, inflated. Most of them anymore are sealed or rubbered, full of foam, whatever, solid, however it's brand you use, whatever it's done. Make sure that they have the correct air. If sitting over time, of course, the air pressure will deflate. Um, cold air, hot air and causes tires to increase in pressure. Cold air will um, cause the air pressure in tires to diminish. We have, and I'm just going to kind of re read it, uh, a checklist. Uh, they'll drive a test drive and inspect thing that we have to kind of keep us on track. Um, and you can kind of see it here, and I've, we've got it uh, laminated. But this is very helpful to me and my technicians when going through this. Um, inspect for rips or sagging. This is the seat in the back. Check to make sure the chair doesn't wobble too much and is adjusted properly. Um, if you're working on chairs, make sure you get the seat on all the way. I personally did that once. I, I did not have a seat locked down. I set it on, the consumer went off down the hallway and all of a sudden just took a hard turn to the left on the seat and it threw her arms off the steering wheel and she crashed into the wall. Lois, just never mind that you heard that. <laughs> but it was uh, a little bit embarrassing to say the least. I'm certainly not exempt from making uh, mistakes or human error. Um, make sure that seat belts are secured in good condition. Inspect for flat spots or wear. I, I guess I could run back in there and show you some examples of tires that have flat spots. That's pretty obvious what that looks like. Um, check for cracks in the sidewalls. Um, loose, loose wheel nuts and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, same as a car, you know, you don't want the, the wheels to fall off. Um, batteries, we do a voltage test, we do a load test, we check for cor corrosion or burn marks. Um, if you see a lot of corrosion on batteries, that's not good, especially on sealed batteries. Um, if you see black marks around the connections, and, and that's an indication of heat, too many amps, more than likely it's just a loose connection. And you can go like this and, and wiggle it and, and go, oop, I need to cinch that down a little bit. Um, another thing that we like to, to check is the throttle pot. If you were to look at this, which I can't flip this around, you have your forward and your reverse. That's the throttle pot, and it's on a, on a, a potentiometer um, type thing, but it uses a jam nut. We see those come loose all the time. And they may only move ever so slightly, but just uh, a movement in either direction, minute as it may be, may cause it to go faster forward or faster in reverse and really throw things off. So we like to make sure that those are tight and properly adjusted before we send them out. Then all cables, um, onboard, offboard chargers work, horn works, lights, the shroud is free of cracks and peeling, and we just kind of, um, here we take pride in what we do. If a consumer brings in a, a um, scooter that's in, in rough shape, we'll try to armor all of them and give them a nice shine before we send out the door. If you can look at this one right here, I haven't had a chance to fix this. In fact, a, about a week ago I caught this, you'll see a crack. If you'll notice on this crack, you'll see a small hole drilled. I did that. And the reason why I did that is if you drill a small hole at the very um, end point of that crack, you're going to, um, that by, by, by doing that, that will stop the crack from progressing. And then we can take and drill holes and, and uh, put, you know, wire ties or something in there to, to try to fix it. It looks kind of tacky, but... Most of the time, you know, it's better than it completely breaking and, and causing other, other issues. You can see this, this particular scooter has been around for a while and has had some, some, some good use. Um, I know I'm sucking the air out of the room. I hope I'm not moving too fast. I tend to do that. Um, if I had a, uh, I do not have a power chair. I know this was talking about power chairs 
and scooters today. Everything that I've talked about, everything that you've seen uh, applies to power chairs as well. Of course, on a power chair, you're not going to necessarily see um, alignment problems. Their motors are bolted directly, but what you will see is bent frames and stuff. I've had them come in, you know, pigeon-toed and look like they've just dropped right off a three-foot ledge. Um, and, of course, there's not much you can do with that. That's you can try to straighten it, but you don't know where the, the bend is, or in other words, the fulcrum point, and try to straighten that out. It can be kind of tricky. Um, on joysticks, uh, I know this is some of this may be just common sense or common knowledge, and you're going, yeah, I, I understand, I know. But make sure they're covered um, when, you, when you transport them in adverse weather. Um, the joystick is also a control unit and I've had so many people, quite a few people come in that have ruined two and three thousand dollar controllers just by transporting them in the fog. It wasn't even raining, it was just the humidity was quite high that day and it got in. Sometimes I can dry them out and recover them. Um, these particular VSI controllers are called are quite prone to that. I personally don't, don't care for these. I try to replace them with this particular controller here that you can see I, it, it was, I believe, the, the precursor to this one, but it's a nice heavy-duty aluminum frame, simple on and off button, um, the d speed dials, I've had little if no trouble with these, these older um, VSI controllers. And so some, these are, are like gold to me, I try to <laughs> collect as many as I can. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, in talking about uh, batteries, I, I hope I've made it uh, somewhat clear. Again, you know, you're only going to get, you know, like I said, about a year if you use that battery every day. Now, of course, if you're using that battery, just had a consumer come in, he said, you know, I've, I've, I, we put new batteries in his, his uh, chair just before I came in here. He's like, I've got three to five years out of my chair. And I asked, and he said, and I know that, um, that that's kind of high. I've, I think he said I went three and a half years before, um, since he'd been in here last, and we put new batteries in his wife's uh, scooter. And I asked him, well, um, you know, I kind of got personal. I imagine his wife was not a, a very light person, and she was, and she doesn't use the scooter every day. She uses it just a little bit here and there, but she still charges it. Now, um, the final note that I want to end on, and this is quite critical, um, and I wish I had a, I wish I had a charger. I, I'm in the process of getting ready to purchase one, but it's very important that you have the right charger um, with the with the batteries, especially these sealed um, AGM batteries or lead acid. They use a gel between the lead. That's why they're corn gel versus water. Um, and the reason being is you, you can quite literally ruin these batteries almost overnight. So you come in with this sealed battery, and I put a regular automotive charger on it, and I leave it for 24 hours. The battery is at 9 volts. That charger will never shut off, and it keeps going and going and going, and, it's, and it goes in through those cells and just cooks that battery. I don't want to give you the molecular breakdown as to why that happens, but it is so hard on them. You have to use, make sure that whatever charger, and like I said, most manufacturers, they come with a charger that charges the correct charger for those batteries. And those chargers are designed to shut off. And I brought a charger in here with me. I was looking for it over there, but I had set it over here. On the charger, you want to make sure that it sa says, this one right here says, this charger is for a 24 volt lead acid sealed battery. Um, Recommended for 12 to 35 amp hour battery, so it's a small one. They don't even want you using this one on a say. Uh, let's 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 talk about a permobile that's just decked out right that probably has 75 amp hour batteries in it because it has all the bells and whistles, head arrays, and you just you just you name it. Um, it's very important that you use this type of battery charger. And the reason being is because when it reaches 14 volts, which is the battery's true potential, it automatically uh, shuts off. And, and this can be done 
by a timer as well. If you want to use a timer and use a regular charger, but how do you know when that battery is charged? Now, there's been a lot of extensive research done um, on using these these gel specific sealed um, chargers that that uh, are, in other words, termed smart chargers. And this one is a few years old. They've really gotten advanced in the last uh, several years. And if you look at your standard charger, you'll notice if you have one of those chargers, if I had one in with me, I'd, I'd show you, but it, you can actually switch from, uh, it'll I say an AGM or a sealed battery to a non. And it gives you those options for a very specific reason. That is very critical that you use the correct charger um, for the, the type of batteries you have in it, if it does not have an onboard charger, and or if you're like us, you've had some problems with chargers, but we've taken the batteries out, so we've got them on the bench, and we're going to charge them up. We've got to use that specific charger so that we do not ruin the batteries. Um, that, that happens a lot of times, especially, you know, when we're, if we don't understand why, and we can ruin batteries, and as we all know, batteries are not, not cheap. Um... Any other questions? I apologize. I was kind of tripping over my tongue talking about this. I, I wanted to go deeper, uh, I, I think, for today, uh, just understanding what creates 24, why wheelchairs use 24. It's because when so, in so doing, you can use a smaller wire. Your amp hours stay the same. When you um, hook and in uh, parallel, you're just going from positive to positive, negative to negative. You're, remain, you're keeping the 12 volts along the way, just as a recap here, but you're keeping your amp hour. Every time you um, uh, hook a battery parallel, you're just adding that much more amps. And you'll see this in, 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 on big trucks. Um, sometimes they use a lot more amps to turn over those great big starters, etc. And, and such may be the, the case. Anyway, um, I don't think I have anything else to talk about. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming. I hope this has been uh, clear. I, I believe there will be some contact information, so if you have any questions, no matter where you're at in the world, you can call me. I don't claim to be a know-it-all, but I will certainly will go to bat and find out the answers to your questions and if, whatever they may be. So. Anyway, thank you. Okay, and now we're going to have Amy Henningsen present her part of the evaluations of clients to fit them for a wheelchair by reviewing anatomical landmarks and how to properly measure an individual. Uh, and just a little bit about Amy. She's a registered occupational therapist and is a 1974 graduate of Eastern Michigan University. She is certified in neurodevelopmental treatment in pediatrics and also as an assistive technology practitioner. She has over 30 years of experience working with developmental disabilities in a variety of settings. She currently provides direct and consultative services for the Up to Three Early Intervention Program and is also a member of our UATP staff. And just a reminder uh, to those of you who requested a certificate of attendance, if you could please email me your mailing address, uh, not your email, and you can send that to uh, Story Powell's email. And if you have any questions, uh, please relay them through the uh, chat function and I will get those to the presenter. And just a reminder to also fill out the evaluation when the presentation is over. Uh, that helps us plan for future trainings. And now we will turn the time to Amy. And I'm hoping Clay will come back here so I can use him as my model, unless Story would like to do that. Um, as Story mentioned today, I'm going to cover, excuse me while I put this on here, taking basic wheelchair positioning measurements. And when I say that, um, I'm talking about someone who may be um, using a wheelchair intermittently. They're not using it throughout the day. They do not have complex medical needs. They don't have a neuromotor disorder. Those types of individuals need specialized seating. They need um, a therapist and a team to be involved. You need either uh, uh, the consumer, the caregiver, family, OTPT, 
uh, assistive technology professional, a durable medical um, representative, and as well as the doctor's cooperate, cooperation. So we're not talking about that type of evaluation. That would take a very long time to cover. But today what we're going to do is we're going to just cover some basic information on how to measure, do you want this facing this way? An individual for a wheelchair. I have a couple different handouts that we'll make available to you. Uh, one is we'll go ahead and put these forms on that show you the types of measurements you want to take so you can practice and uh, write down some measurements yourself. I'll also uh, provide you with a handout that is really nice for anyone who is working in the field. When you go out to see um, a client or a consumer, you can use this form to go through their entire wheelchair and it covers things like, is the frame rusty? Is there a crack in the frame? Are the wheels worn out? And how I use this form is I would go out and just highlight the areas where there's problems. So when you go to write your letter of medical necessity, if you go that route, you have all that information here. Another form that we'll go ahead and put on the uh, website is just your basic uh, wheelchair evaluation. And this goes through everything that you would uh, want to cover, the reason for referral, the client's goals, you know, are they just wanting to get from the front door out to their car, they want to use the wheelchair to go in the mall, or is it someone who needs to be in their chair, you know, to go to their job, so they're going to be sitting in their chair all day long. So you want to know what the goals and the concerns are. Um, and this will go through all types of different areas, what their medical needs are, um, if they've had surgeries, if they have vision problems, hearing problems. Um, it's just an evaluation form and you can go through and check what the person is using it for. Um, even things regarding transfers, so if you have someone that is um, transferring, whether they're doing it independently or with assistance. So we'll make that available to you. As well as um, Sunrise Medical provides these really lovely charts that talk a lot about seating and positioning. And they'll cover different reasons why people assume different postures. Um, one of the things we'll kind of show you with Clay, since I'm using his, him for the model, since he has the Utah State logo on. <laughs> But we'll show you some of the different patterns that people get into and some of the compensatory patterns and why you, when you're doing your measurements, you need to be aware of that. So that's where we're going to go today. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. When I'm doing my evaluations just to get basic measurements, a lot of times the wheelchair vendors have these really nice little uh, retractable measuring tapes that will go in and out. I prefer not to use those, and the reason that I don't like to use those is it's really easy to wrap it around the person. And if you wrap the measuring tape around the person, you're not going to get an accurate measurement. So my preference is, and so especially since I work at the assistive technology lab, is I'll use just a regular contractor's uh, measuring tape because it's rigid and I don't have to worry about wrapping it around the person. So I'm actually getting the measurement across versus if I were using a flexible one, I'll get a different measurement. Another one uh, type that I like to use are just wooden rulers and the same thing. When I go to measure the, the height of the back of the individual, this makes it very easy to put this on the surface and to bring it to their shoulders. I also always, this is a um, wheelchair mat table for evaluations, but if I'm measuring someone for a wheelchair, I want them on a flat, solid surface. If I have them on a cushion like a couch, I'm not going to get an accurate measurement because they're going to sink into the surface. If I use a chair like we have here uh, in the classroom, this looks relatively flat, but it isn't. It's got a, a contour to it. So once again, I'm not going to get an accurate measurement. So it's real important that you have a flat surface. Um, you know, uh, 
You know, if you're in someone's home, you could even use a coffee table. Generally, those are a height that someone can use. So I will invite my consumer, Mr. Christensen, over to the mat table. He didn't know he was going to get stuck doing this. So as he's sitting here, one of the first considerations I want to look at while I'm going to, when I'm doing this evaluation is he's got this nice little t-shirt on. Well, what's going to happen is I'm not going to get a realistic portrayal of, of his body. So if you don't mind, would you mind removing that? Nope. Another thing that would happen if I were actually working with a client, generally if I'm working on a flat surface like this, this is really fatiguing to the individual. So I would either, I would ask someone to support their back or I would ha have someone stand behind them and help them stabilize so they're comfortable. Now Clay's kind of a tall guy, so ideally I want to have his legs out here at a 90 degree angle. So I want his heels under his knee. He's a little bit bow-legged. You ride a horse? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot. <laughs> so we're going to get him in kind of what we would call a functional position. Now, it's with the pelvis, when we're putting, doing a seating evaluation, the pelvis is the key point of control. And we want the pelvis in a symmetrical orientation, so my hip bones are level. And we want the pelvis so it's in a more upright position. This is considered a posterior tilt. So if I'm sitting on a, a chair surface, and I slide forward like this. This is referred to as a posterior tilt. And the compensatory pattern for that is to, because you want to right yourself and bring your head up, is you end up doing this. So then you develop what they call a curvature of the spine or a kyphosis, which brings your shoulders forward, and then you crank your head up. So when I'm doing my evaluation, the first thing I want to do is to make sure that the individual is in a good position. And before I touch them, I will say to them, because um, I'm a woman, Clay is a gentleman, um, and I, um, you know, if I'm measuring a, a client, I don't know them, so I'm going to say, Clay, would you mind if I used my hands to get you positioned so I can do the measuring? Nope. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come down here and I'm going to find his hip bones right here. And I'm going to use all these little simple terms like, <laughs> like hip bones because all of us know what hip bones are. So I'm going to find his hip bones here. And as I feel his hip bones, by using my thumbs, I can tell that, he's, that those hip bones are level. If you have what they call a pelvic obliquity, where maybe he would have spasticity in this muscle group and it's pulling him down this way, this hip might come up. And so what you'll see is you'll see an unevenness of the hips. That's a more complex medical need. And if you're consistently seeing that, you're going to want to have a more thorough evaluation done. Because him leaning to that direction might be caused by increased muscle tone or it might be caused by weakness and I want to see if I can get it balanced out. The other consideration is there are deformities that are fixed that I can't change. For example, um, oftentimes people will get into a position like this and their hips are stuck in this position and it's a fixed deformity. If I try to force that out, and believe me this has been done as a therapist, you will break the hip. That's a fixed deformity, it's not flexible. However, if I can use a mat and get him stretched out and move that hip, then he has a flexible deformity. So if you see some of those patterns, that's not a basic wheelchair measurement type of person. This is for someone who is working out in, say, independent living skills. You're going out to your client. They look terrible in their wheelchair. They're not sitting well. Their, their legs are hanging six inches in front of the seat and you're going, wow, what's wrong here? I think I need to do some measurements 
maybe I need to get a wheelchair vendor in. So generally, the first measurement that we're going to take is the measurements of the hips. And once again, I like to use this um, a rigid surface because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the outside. I'm going to use my hand here and my hand here. And Clay has pretty skinny hips here, 15 inches. So on my form, I'm going to write for his hip width is 15 inches. Generally, wheelchairs seating go in two inch increments. So he would probably look at a 16 inch seat. You also always add, I would never get him a 15 inch seat because he's going to have a coat on, he's going to have different types of clothing on, and I don't want him so snug in there that he doesn't have a little room to move around because as all of us sit here, we're all moving around. So we're always going to add an inch or two inches. Some people really like to be snug in their chairs. Other people like more room. Um, and if you have a consumer that can give you that information, I always ask them, do you like to scoot around, Clay? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like tight places. So we're good. The other th <clears throat> aspect of that is if you have a narrower chair, it's going to be less stable. You're going to have less. Um, s stability in a narrow chair. However, it's going to allow you to go in and out of doorways easier. If, for example, uh, at the USU campus here, I'm sure it's much easier to have a narrower chair to get in and out of doorways and to move around. So that's another consideration. But you, we always know that if we have a wider base, we have more stability. So, you know, if depending on the individual, they can give you that information. So that's some considerations on the, the width of the um, hips. So then I'm going to go ahead and measure the seat depth. Now, generally, what you're going to find with men, and I will let you kind of focus in here, men tend to be in a little bit more natural posterior tilt than a woman is. A woman will tend to sit more on our butt bones or our ischial tuberosities, and men tend to sit back a little bit more on their sacrum. That's how we roll. <laughs> That's how you roll. <laughs> and, you, and you see that all the time when you are in and out of each other's cars, because when I get in the car, I bring my seat up, because my husband, when he gets in the car, he lets it back. So we play this little game. But men generally tend to have a slightly more natural posterior tilt. And you can see that with clay versus with me, I tend to have more of a lumbar lower doses here, whereas clay is a little bit more this way. That's OK. You're not a girl, so we're, we'll forgive you. When we're measuring the depth of a seat, we want to measure from the not from his hip bones, but from the fleshiest part of the body. And, um, you know, oftentimes as people are in wheelchairs and they're unable to be active, uh, gaining weight is kind of a natural thing. If there's redundant tissue there, we measure it because that's part of the seating that we're going to have. If I'm in someone's home, don't worry, I won't hit you. No, I'm not going to you. I was getting ready to... You're fine. <laughs> If I'm in someone's home, oftentimes I'll use a book. But since I'm in the lab, I have this nice slab of wood. So what I'm going to do with this wood is I'm going to place it back behind clay. Now, I have a space back there between clay's back and the, and his, and the, the back of his britches. So if I measure from the back of his britches forward, what's going to happen when he sits down in that chair is he's actually going to be pushed forward because he has, um, because of his trunk. So I'm going to go ahead and measure it from my board, which is perpendicular to the area when I put his feet into a 90 degrees. I don't want him, if he flexes his leg, I'm going to once again get a shorter measurement. So I'm going from this perpendicular portion here, and I'm putting my ruler there, and then I'm using my finger to go behind 
his knee, which the therapists call the popliteal fossa. And there he is 21 inches. When we are seating someone for a wheelchair, we don't have a seating system that goes directly to the back of their leg. We want to have clearance there so the person doesn't have pressure. Anytime you have prolonged pressure, whether it's on a knee, whether it's on a, a, bony, uh, a bony butt, <laughs> you're at risk for creating a decubiti ulcer or a pressure sore. And once you notice that there's a pressure sore, you're already in trouble because um, pressure sores develop from the inside out. So we want to make sure that we give him some space here. So I'm going to go ahead and measure this. And then rather than adding an inch or two like I did for the seat um, width, I'm going to subtract two inches because I want to have at least two fingers between the back of his leg and the end of his seat. So there he's at 19 inches. There are some variations. If you have someone who has a significant discrepancy between where their pelvis is and the flesh of their back, they call it a biangular back, and it brings the back up against the pelvis because we want a stable pelvis for, for motor control. And it also has another part of the back that angles differently so you can have an appropriate back support while containing the pelvis. But we're not going to worry that, about that with Clay because he just uses his wheelchair to get in and out of the car and go to the shopping mall. To measure the, the height of the back, it varies. Uh, depending on the individual, once again, we're looking at someone who may be just using their, their wheelchair for transport. So, um, you know, if I go, if he needs the upper trunk control because he falls back, I would go from the seating surface to the top of his shoulders, which is 11 inches here. Generally, people who are using a transport chair are going to be propelling themselves, and we want to give them freedom through their, their shoulder blade or, or their scapula so that they can propel. So I may choose to find the lower point of his shoulder blades and have a lower back. Individuals who, who are paraplegics, who are very active, prefer the lowest back that they can get because it gives them all that freedom and mobility. But generally, um, I would go for uh, kind of a standard back, and this is to the base of his scapulas right here is 16 inches. So that would be another measurement I would take. Um, in regard to the footrest, Clay's a little bit tough here because he's a tall guy. And so he's really, um, let's see if we can get you at a 90. So here's his, yeah, and actually this is about a 90. He's got his work shoes on. I've, I've done wheelchair assessments where I've had women who always wear heels. I say, do you always wear heels? They go, yes, I always wear heels. Because if they do, I'm not going to measure that foot flat. I'm going to measure for the foot rest in the shoes that they normally wear. Are these typical of the shoes that you wear? Yes. It's kind of flat and narrow sole? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go, once again, from the, from the popliteal fossa, or right under his knee and his thigh, to the floor. And he's, once again, 16 inches there. When you're doing a foot rest, you want to have a minimum of two inch clearance. Well, let's we'll see if we can do this. Under the foot rest, so that the individual has clearance to get over thresholds and that type of thing. Obviously, this is a, quite a large wheelchair. So I'm going to show you some of the problems that Clay would have having this type of wheelchair. So we're going to take this measurement, but we have one other consideration that we have to think about when we're thinking about measuring the, the leg length. 
I would write down under my information the 16 inches, but I need to take into consideration what type of cushion he's going to have. Because if he has a 2 inch cushion, then I need to reduce that length to 14 inches. If he's going to have a 3 inch cushion, I need to subtract the 3 inches because that's going to be the base of where the back of his thigh is going to be. Um, in terms of the chest, um, typically I don't measure the distance between the knees for someone unless they have some complications, if they have what we call a windswept deformity, some of those complicated medical conditions. Um, and this is kind of a comfortable position for Clay to sit in. And I'm looking for, number one, safety, comfort, and function. Um, you don't want someone to be sitting in a wheelchair and be uncomfortable all day. But one thing I am going to measure is I'm going to measure his chest width here. Same thing, I'm going to go on the outer sides of his chest, and I'm going to get a measurement here, and that's 13 inches. So if he needed some upper trunk control, I would measure, have a measurement there. If I have laterals, if he's weak on one side and falling to one side, I may want to have a lateral uh, thigh or lateral uh, trunk support so that it would help keep him up. So that's why you would take that measurement. If he had, if his legs were rubbing against the side of the chair, I might add some lateral hip guides to help position him more that way. If you're looking at um, a, um, an individual who has a lot of, as we say, redundant tissue, and the widest part is here, it, at the thighs, you're going to go ahead and measure the thigh uh, width. So that would be the widest point that you're looking for for a seat. But you may have some hip guides in here to position the pelvis while having a seat that's comfortable for the individual. So if Clay were to sit in this seat, which is obviously too big, I can demonstrate some of the issues that he would have. Yes, you can. You're ambulatory. <laughs> Oftentimes in nursing homes, what you see is just like Clay is. He's in a sling seat and back. The problem with a sling seat and back is over a period of time, you're going to slide to one side or, a, or the other. The other thing is, is look what happened to his spine. So. Unless I'm using a chair for transport only, if I'm getting someone in and out of the car, into, the, into a medical appointment, into church, some of those types of things, I would feel fine about a chair like this. If I have someone in a nursing home, I want some type of firm seat and back on that chair because I don't want him collapsing here in his chest because what happens is, you start collapsing in your respiratory system, you start getting um, pressure in your uh, abdominal region, and the, all those physiological needs that the body has is meant to be more upright. But what happens is people will just collapse. Now, one of the things that I would always want to make sure with Clay as I was doing this is I would want to make sure, is your chair locked? Uh, is it locked or unlocked? Do you want to lock it? Yeah. Yep, lock it. Lock it. Now, I'm kind of a little gal, but I'm going to bring Clay up and get him seated better in this chair. Because what's happened is, oftentimes when people will sit in the chair, is they tend to slump. And if he moves his, if you slump in this chair, slump, bring your seat forward. So now he's sitting in, the, in this really posterior tilt. So now you're going up to the dinner table to eat. Now what are you going to do? It's going to be awkward. Well, but, reach. yeah. So it's pretend, awkward. yeah. So this is oftentimes what you see. So the impression is, and that's what some of these charts will give you, and you can go through them, and they'll show you what happens. He doesn't fit in this wheelchair. It's it's the seat is way too short. Well, let's see. So. What I'm going to do is I cross 
the client's arms across their chest. I grasp their wrists, and Clay's a big guy and I'm a little gal. I bend my knees and I go, and I straighten up my, I straighten my knees. That was kind of nice. <laughs> so, do you want to do that now? So what ended up happening there is I was able to move his pelvis back into the proper position and see how that changed his alignment. Um, so say for example you have weakness on one side. Oh, one other measurement is if I have the elbow here, I want to be able to have a 90 degree angle here. So I would measure on a firm surface from the firm surface to where his elbow is bent. And that's going to tell me the height of the armrest that I want. Because I want him to be able to rest his arm because that's going to give an individual a lot of balance reaction. So now let's ha just have you slump to this side since your armrest isn't here. Hey Amy, we have a question. Yes ma'am. Jody asks, uh, she says she has a couple of teenage boys who have sling backs but they have developed uh, scoliosis. Both of these boys are able to propel themselves and have a lot of trunk mobility. What back would you suggest? Um, the, going back to the original um, a s statement I made is the pelvis is the key point of control. So the first thing that I want to look at if someone has, is it a scoliosis, does she say, or a kyphosis? A kyphosis is a forward lean, a scoliosis is a lateral lean. Yeah, it's a scoliosis. So with a scoliosis, what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to look at that pelvis because I want to know, is it a pelvic problem? Is, and is it a flexible issue or is it unflexible? So, you know, depending on the child and the problem, you know, first I want to look at the pelvis. Is the pelvis level? Does he have a firm seating surface? So when he's, the individual is sitting, just like when uh, Clay just leaned to the side, you end up doing weight bearing more on one side than the other. And then what you do as a compensatory pattern is you come up like that. So now I have a scoliosis. If I can come down and sit like this, I may just come up straight if it's a compensatory pattern. If it's a muscle tone issue and I'm unable to get that seat straightened out, I want to first see if I can get that squared away and I would address the seat first. And if I needed to, I would have some buildup on one side and see if I can get the pelvis level and see if they could get a a back that's straight. Oftentimes for a mild scoliosis, even just a curved back can be enough. It's like a back like, like this, that you have a curved back, so it gives you a center and it gives you a place to rest. So if you just have a mild scoliosis, possibly because of muscular weakness, a curved back may be appropriate. If you have a lot of muscle tone or the person's propelling because they're stronger on one hand than the other, then I may want to add some lateral supports, possibly to a mild curved back or to a back that is more what we call a planar back. I always kind of like the contoured backs, but I might add the lateral supports to keep them centered in the wheelchair. Lateral supports control scoliosis an anterior chest harness provides control anterior posterior. Um, I think it's always good if your sons are having those problems, if they're of school age, um, you may have therapists in the school. There are some very, very good wheelchair vendors out there now that uh, you can contact. Um, if they're school age, under the age of 22, children with special health care services have clinics throughout the state and um, they have therapists that have done uh, seating and positioning for a really long time. So that's a, another option for you. I would try to figure out why they're having the problem and then I would address the problem. And you're more than welcome to call us here and, and talk directly with me about that and we can possibly help you get somebody out there to take a look at that. 
So with Clay being able to use his armrests like that, it gives him the opportunity to push himself up. If he starts getting fatigued, you know, it can help him ride himself on different environments. Um, you know, you really need to be able to look at the home environment, the work environment, the time and the places that people are using it. Um, like I say, when I was caring for my mother, I had a, just a transport chair with a sling seat in back that I could fold up, throw in my trunk, get her in and out of the, the day center. She wasn't in it. When she got home, we got her out and we got her in a chair. So there's all those considerations that kind of I outlined in the evaluation form. So it's like a big puzzle. You take all those little pieces and you piece together what is the best system for someone. But I think, um, especially in nursing home situations, that there are things that can be done to help people with their positioning. Even if you take a bath towel and fold it up in thirds, roll it up and stick it so the person isn't just falling to the side. Um, but that's a topic for another day. Um, I hope that covered some of the basic information. I feel like I was just on a verbal horse race. Likewise. <laughs> but I hope that information is helpful. Um, it's very complicated. I take wheelchair positioning very seriously because there's really serious ramifications when you do it wrong. But there are a lot of really good people out there that would be able to help you. So uh, feel free to contact us if you need to find someone in your area and we can help you get referred to a um, person who has a good background in seating and positioning. And I thank you for your time. And if you would like to contact us, you can find our information on our website.